Good evening, everyone, and welcome. And I, I want to start, start out by saying thank you um, for all of you um, giving up your time to be part of this. And uh, the fact that you're here means I also want to thank you for what you already do in the community. Because the main thing I wanted to try and do is get people with a diversity of backgrounds. We can't get everybody. So uh, we can't get every neighborhood. We, we don't want it to get so unwieldy that it doesn't serve its purpose. But um, the goal of the overall process is to get everyone involved. Um, but not everyone can be on this committee because we just there's just great trouble. But um, I, I think that as you all get to know each other, you're going to see what I, I see right now because I know all of you. Um, you're going to meet some interesting people, um, and the, 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 the core value I think that you all have, and, and, and why you're here, is that you care about the city, you care about our community as a community, and you want to see, you genuinely want to see it made better, and. Uh, um, you all know what this community is like. It's a community where a lot of people are engaged. So um, we want to take that uh, asset that we have in the city and bring it to bear in this comprehensive plan to get as many people involved as possible. And the numbers of people participating already are significant um, with the different, we're allowing people to contribute in all kinds of ways. So, um, so I think uh, it'll be fun as we get to know each other. Um, I'm looking at smiling because I think it's going to work really well. The other thing I did was, I feel when I put people on boards and commissions is put people on, they don't have to agree on everything, but, but treat each other nicely. You know, <laughs> you know I, I, someone I know in government uh, said, oh, this guy's a pain in the neck, let's put him on a committee. And I'm thinking, yeah, congratulations to all the people on that committee that have the pain in the neck now. So it doesn't mean we, we agree on everything, but it means, you know, this is a nice group and I think you're going to have a good time. That's it. That's Great. Thank you so much, Mayor. Thank you for that introduction. I agree with everything that the mayor said. Um, it's a great group of people. I know many of you. Um, I've met many of you. And for those of you that I've not, I'm looking forward to getting to know you and meeting you and working with you. I'm Judy Mezzi. I'm Deputy Commissioner of Planning for the city. I'm supposed to advance the slide now. Um, so, um, I'm just going to take a couple of minutes to do some introductions. I'll, um, I'll say first of all that we have a couple of people missing. There are two members of the committee that haven't yet shown up. Um, and then there are three people that are joining us by phone. So, they are here, but you, you just can't really see them. Um, and then I would also like to uh, say from our Commissioner Gomez, Chris Gomez, Unfortunately, he's under the weather right now. So, um, and if you know Chris, you know he must be really under the weather if he's not showing up at this meeting or calling in. So, he sends his very, very best. Um, he sends you all the welcoming email. You will see a lot of him. You will hear a lot from him, and he will want to hear a lot from you. So, um, he really is the um, leading this uh, community, uh, this comprehensive to plan effort. So we are sorry that he's not here, but he's with us, certainly. We can feel that he is with us. So, um, so the other thing I want to say is that um, the agenda that we're going, that you're looking at, is a little, is slightly different than the agenda that was sent to you originally. So, but we know you all flex some, uh, flexible enough. We, all, we know you all looked at that agenda and memorized it, so you know it's different, but we know that you're flexible enough to go with us. Um, Please note that there's a Quizlet coming up. So if you have not already looked at your Quizlet, and I think I said to many of you coming in, how you do does not uh, affect your service on this committee, but you might want to just get a look at the Quizlet. So we are going to go through the Quizlet. Um, we are going to um, go through uh, what, what we've done so far on the comprehensive plan, a review the draft outline. You can read all the rest. Um, but at the end of it, we're going to ask you a question, and I want you to view all of this with this question in mind. So the question that's going to be asked of you at the end is, uh, what, what do you all, what do the members need to keep in mind in order to make this pro process successful? So that's our challenge, that's our question that we're going to offer at the end, so be keeping that in mind as we go through the presentation. Okay, so who's in the room right now? So I introduced myself. I, the mayor already spoke. I, um, our commissioner is is, uh, is here, definitely, uh, through this process. We have three other members of the um, planning department team here with us today. We have Eileen and Katie and Christy, and you'll be hearing from each of them as we move through the slides. 
We have many other people at the planning department, but this is the team that really helped put this evening together. So that's who we're featuring on these slides. And then um, we sort of sat on the opposite side and on that side of the room. We have our consultants uh, from BFJ. We have Sarah and Mark and Thomas. And um, Christine Jimenez, who's not with us at the, this evening, has also been an integral member of our team as well. And then, of course, we have all of you. So you are the most important people in the room this evening. And I want to thank you again for, um, for joining us. And what I'm going to ask you to do in just a minute, because as the mayor said, you are all asked to join. You're all selected because each of you brings something unique to this process. Each of you represents some aspect of the White Plains, the comprehensive White Plains, one White Plains that is important to this process. So I'm going to ask each of you to introduce yourself succinctly with a like a one sentence introduction as to um, wait, I wrote it down so that I can give you the, uh, and I need my glasses too, so, so you see that. A brief introductory sentence about you and your connection to White Plains. So not a thesis, just a brief introductory sentence. John, I know you can do this, so I'm going to start with you. Uh, my name is John Eichlers. I currently uh, chair the planning board in the city of White Plains. I've lived here since 1981, and I also chair the White Plains Performing Arts Center. Perfect. Cecilia? Uh, Cecilia Bacall. I've uh, been living on Plains since 1990. I chair the Zone Board of Appeals. I am the president of the board of a Century Spinal. I'm an attorney, immigration attorney. Fabulous. Cecilia? Good evening. I'm Cecilia Cortez. I lived in my Plains since 1972. And I've lived here with my husband and my children. I'm part of the Citizens Advisory Committee um, for the CBBG uh, um, grant program. And uh, I went to, I think, every single school here in White Plains. From <laughs> 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 right the school all the way through uh, White Plains High School. And I just truly love White Plains. I really do. And that's been yes. part of this group. Thank you. Ken. Hi, I'm, I'm Ken Query, and I am the current chair of the Community Development Citizens Advisory Committee. And I've been in White Plains since 1991, so I'm just announcing. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Erin? I'm Erin O'Keefe. I'm a third generation White Plains resident who grew up here and have uh, children in the school system, and I own Ice Cream Social. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Danny? My name is Daniel Salazar. I've lived here in White Plains for about 14 years. I work in different departments like Parks and Recs in Greensboro. I'm a police officer in uh, New York City. And I uh, look forward to coming here to my place to all week. Thank you so much. Yeah. Hi, I'm Vanilla Yapati, uh, downtown Muller. I've been here for four years, but uh, I'm originally from India. And I've lately caught myself whenever people ask me, so where are you from? I said, my place is New York. I guess uh, this is a big home, and uh, I'm an energy and I'm an environmental professional. Fabulous. Mike? Hi, I'm Mike Tiffany. I was born in White Plains. Raised in Hartsdale, went to school at Stephen Actually, moved back to White Plains, started my business here, raised three children, now I have seven grandchildren, three in White Plains. We all went to the White Plains school system and went to Stephen Actually. <laughs> 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 I learned shortly after that it was a lot more. And I was fortunate enough to start my business in White Plains, and without White Plains, I wouldn't be where I am today. And I'm just so delighted to be on this committee and to meet all of you. To share where we're going. Thank you so much, Mike. Bonnie? Hi, I'm Bonnie Silverman. I'm CEO of Silverman Realty Group. We own several commercial properties in the central business district. Uh, we've owned our properties in White Plains since 1969. Our office has been here since 1980. Um, I am also the chairwoman of the White Plains Business Improvement District. I'm happy to serve White Plains. I love this city. Thanks so much, Bonnie. And Raina? Hi, everyone. I'm Raina. I was born and raised in White Plains. Also went all the way to the school district <laughs> from uh, church, well, East Street for preschool, like Church Street, um, East Street again in high school. Uh, I held a number of youth leadership positions during that time. And then now I'm back in White Plains and work in philanthropy and MasterCard. And really, it's an honor to be here. I can't say it better, but I, White Plains made me who I am today. So uh, 
really love the city. I'm excited to work with all the other together. Wonderful. Thank you so much. And so we have two folks on the phone. We have Mike Dalton. Mike, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Can you hear me? I can. Wow. And could you introduce yourself, Mike, with an, an introductory statement? Sure. Yeah. My name is Michael Dalton. I'm an architect. I've lived in White since 1984. Uh, I'm currently and have been for a number of years as president of the Fisher Hill Association. Thank you so much, Mike. And Linda, are you there? Thank you so much, and I am just really impressed that the whole group actually did that perfectly. So thank you so much. We really have a sense of the amazing one white plainsness that we have here in the room and on the phone and on the committee. And enough about that, because I know you're all wanting to know whether you got the Quizlet correct. <laughs>
It's the roadmap or instruction manual for how to realize the plan's vision for our future. Why plan? Um, first, let's acknowledge that change is inevitable and also that it's not bad. Um, it's an indication of a healthy community. And even if we do nothing, change will occur here. So change is not bad. Um, but we want to have some say in what kinds of changes occur. Uh, sometimes change is unexpected, as we have learned from COVID. And sometimes it's planned for with a comprehensive plan. Uh, next, we have acknowledged that land use planning has been used to codify advantage. It has been used to limit opportunity, concentrate poverty, and to preserve and transfer wealth, among other things. It can also be used to overcome that history. To create an opportunity for participation from a broader range of people, our comprehensive plan process is intended to engage people throughout the city, and that's why you were all selected. Uh, because we want to learn what their priorities are and goals so that the plan is truly a one white plane. Uh, it formalizes us a way for us to hear from uh, people from throughout the community because I don't want to presume that I know what everybody wants and people bring their unique perspective to the process. Um, and we often rely on the same people to serve on committees and uh, do community service. So I'm very pleased that I don't know all of you, so that means that the Mayor's Outreach did something good because I don't know who all of you are, so you came from somewhere and you're volunteering your time, and I think that's a really great thing. Next we have form a unified vision for, of a future White Plains. Um, a unified vision does not mean everybody wants the same thing. Uh, in fact, we heard throughout the fact-finding and listening to more in phase one of the process that one of the greatest attributes of White Plains is that there's something for everyone. And we want to kind of enhance that, capitalize on it, and ensure that um, our vision is inclusive of everyone um, in the community, not just those who live here, but those who come here to work here, shop here, visit here. And um, although there, people want different things, we there are some universal things that everybody wants, and one of them might be variety. Um, so, develop strategies to achieve the vision. Um, we might consider zoning amendments or uh, legislation that affects open space, affordable housing, uh, development potential, and those are things that are offshoots of the comprehensive plan. If there are recommendations in it to uh, limit development, expand development, we'll amend our zoning ordinance um, and other legislation to achieve those goals. So the city has long recognized the importance of planning uh, for our future. We had the comprehensive kind of plans done in 1928, 62, uh, 77, 97, and 2006. Um, and we, had, uh, we have additional studies that we do, like an open space inventory, a uh, urban renewal plans, um, and transit district plans, uh, a consolidated plan. All of these things are information that we gather that will influence and inform what kinds of decisions that we make going into the future. Um, so the comprehensive plan, your comprehensive, plan will be different from these previous plans in that it will be um, an online interactive plan that we hope uh, will be a progressive model for other communities to follow. Thank you, Eileen. My name is Katie Crawford. I'm one of the planners in the planning department. Um, so, Eileen kind of walked you through our history of planning white plans, and I'm sort of going to catch you up from what we've started with this plan and how we got to this point now. Um, so, as Eileen said, we started with phase one, that was our imagine phase. Um, the plan is going to be broken up into three separate phases imagine, plan, and then implement. Um, they're pretty self explanatory. Um, so, for imagine, what 
what we wanted to do, um, like Edwin said, was really use this uh, a lot of online tools, um, partially out of necessity for COVID, but then partially just um, wanting to modernize the process um, and not just produce a document that goes on a shelf, something that people can actually access and they can see. Um, so we launched the website last June. We started with phase one, like I said, so that phase focused on outreach, data collection, and a lot of analysis. Um, so our goal is to get as much input from residents and stakeholders during this early phase so that we could definitely move forward with something we knew we were going to have a lot of support behind. Um, so we didn't want to hear just from our typical people. Um, we really wanted to get out there and hear from people a lot younger or a lot older or people who aren't typically involved in the process. Um, so what we began with was the vision survey and that's the little blue box there at the top. Uh, so what we did is ask for the public to provide three words that inspired their vision for White Plains. Um, we actually received over 1,200 individual, 1,200, yeah, individual words. Um, the most frequently received ones are the darker blue. Um, so our top responses were affordable, community, diverse slash diversity, and then safe slash safety. Um, so that kind of gives you a framework of what the community is looking for for their vision. Uh, so in addition to that, we also had a box available on the website, like an open comment field that said have more to say. We received another 400 comments through that, and those had comments that came from, you know, support for solar projects, to not wanting to see development, to wanting to see more development, um, and everywhere in between. Um, so for those who are less tech savvy, we also wanted to get out there and actually get into the community, which is our listening tour. This is our, uh, our poster advertising the events. We had held 12 different sessions as well as a three-part Zoom session at the end there uh, to actually get out in the community, have conversations with people, give them the opportunity to ask us questions, explain some of those more complicated things. Um, and then we also have a whiteboard that we brought around with us um, for people to actually write their comments on there, um, which was actually really fun. Uh, we went out to Battle Hill Parks. We went to the farmer's market. We even went to the high school to get high schoolers input. Um, which was awesome. So we also wanted to educate people about the plan. Um, we understand that not everybody knows what a comprehensive plan is, um, so really educating them was a huge part of that process as well. Um, so all of that feedback sort of got rolled up into our November 18th public workshop. That was the first public workshop that we held. Um, so we had a presentation very similar to this one. Um, if you weren't at that meeting, um, then you can see we had sort of like an outdoor like little boards with all of our elements and our vision statements. Um, we had staff there for people to write comments and have um, further discussion. Um, and then we sort of took all of that and um, we're, we're taking all of that input and, and moving with, forward with it. Um, so then as we unveiled our workshop, we also had a partner online tool through our participate tab on the website. So that had the same materials and opportunities that were available at the workshop on the website. Um, and those have been up for about the past six months. Um, and we've received a ton of feedback through there moving forward. Um, most specifically, we had our draft vision, vision statement posted and uh, we received 39 comments on that vision statement. Um, so we had modified our draft vision statement and now we think we have a, a final vision statement that I will read to you now. Um, so we are One White Plains, a welcoming, safe, inclusive community with housing, employment, education, transportation, and recreational opportunities that fulfill the needs of our diverse population. A city where business, culture, and the arts thrive, where the natural environment is valued and where public spaces are accessible, where we acknowledge our history and address regional, social, and economic trends to plan for an equitable and sustainable future. And with that, I'm going to hand it off to BFJ. I'm going to sneak in for a minute while Sarah's coming up here. I just want to take a moment. I know I already introduced our team to BFJ, but it's really nice to have uh, consultants that are guiding us every step of the way and really helping shape this process. So I want to thank them again for their participation. Thanks so much, Judy. And um, again, I'm Sarah Yeagle from BFG Planning. I have met some of you and more than anything, I'm really excited to be here tonight and be kicking off this process with the Comprehensive Plan Committee. Um, as Katie said, we did start this process almost a year ago now. And we are now finally getting in front of all of you and are so anxious to get your feedback and input in this process. 
So the culmination of all of the work that went into that imagining phase and then moving into the plan phase really is an outline for the plan. And I, uh, I think it was Eileen that mentioned that this plan is going to be different than the plans that came before it in the sense that it is going to be an online plan. It will be more concise. It will have links that you can follow. Um, so I was just about to, I was explaining the, the plan will be an online based plan. The chapters will be a little bit more concise, um, very visually oriented, a lot of graphics, and, and hopefully more digestible by the general public. Instead of, you know, typically you might see a lot of comprehensive plans where the chapters are just encyclopedic and go on and on, and you can kind of get lost in those. And so this is supposed to be, you know, going to be much punchier in a way and supported by a lot of hard, hard research and background data that will live in an appendix. There'll be existing conditions and data analysis. Just keep talking, Sarah. Okay. Um, but the general outline for the plan, and this was really developed during that phase one, is the introduction and overview. Where we'll explain what a comprehensive plan is, planning history in the city, and talk about the regional trends. Um, and then the second chapter will be the vision statement and planning goals. We presented the, the revised vision tonight, which was exciting to see. And that will really be followed by the meat of the plan, which are these plan elements. There are six elements in the plan. These were uh, refined through that phase one, presented at the workshop, and consist of green WP, connect, live, work, play, and strengthen WP. And with e within each of those elements, though, the chapters will include an introduction, a summary of those existing conditions, the ones that are most relevant to the topics and objectives, and then ultimately the initiatives that come out, the actual, actionable items that will come out of the plan. Um, but I think the key here is that that existing conditions piece will be punchy and short and really tied directly back to the issues and opportunities that we're discussing in the chapter, instead of just being sort of a, an encyclopedia of all of you know, the information there is to know about a topic. That will be followed by an implementation chapter, which is so critical in the comprehensive planning process that the city have a roadmap for how they actually achieve the initiatives and strategies that come out of those element chapters. And Mark at the outset did um, pass out a, a folder of information. And in that folder, you'll find a few handouts. Uh, one is the vision statement and the top of the, the plan elements and then the topics that are to be discussed under each of those element chapters. So those are really the meat of the plan. We want your feedback on those topics um, to see if we're missing anything. If you see something that jumps out at you, please don't hesitate to either speak tonight. That might be a little bit premature. But follow up with, with Judy and the staff and, and, and any one of us to really let us know if you think we're missing something. You know, this is still, all of this is still in draft form, you know, waiting your feedback. These were the topics, or the, sorry, the elements were presented at that first public workshop, as were the topics. Um, but, you know, this is all still a work in process, progress. Also within this, this folder, you'll find a, a more detailed outline of each chapter of the plan. Uh, you know, take, you get home, and if you're unwinding, feel free to take a look at this, and, you know, give us your feedback. And, have a glass of wine while you're doing it. Um, but there's also a schedule, which I'll talk about in a moment, and a flyer, which we'll talk about as well. So again, the elements, you can see them here. We have an icon for each. Again, this plan will be very uh, heavily rooted in, in, in grounded in icons and just very graphically focused, uh, sort of moving it into a digital age. Um, here you can see the uh, overarching goal for Green WP, which is limit impacts of climate change to ecological systems and the environment. Here you can see the topic, so they range from climate resilience, natural resources, environment, clean energy, and decarbonization. Uh, with respect to Green WP, we do have a specialty sub-consultant on the team, Bramble. They are an international um, firm that specializes in uh, climate resilience and adaptation. They are uh, based out of Denmark. Good European firm doing this work, uh, and so they have been, um, you know, diligently working, and, and I'm really excited to see what they will be proposing with respect to, to Green WP. Um, Connect is uh, you know, transportation, um, circulation related, so provide an accessible, safe pedestrian and multimodal transportation network. The topics here 
you know, transit and, and you see actually the word transportation doesn't actually exist. We try to sort of move away from a car centric focus and really focus on bicycle infrastructure, parking, streets and car free zones, transit and walkability. And of course, transportation and the road network is inherent in all of these things, but is not the focus. Live WP, facilitate livable neighborhoods that offer a variety of housing options. The topics included here are accessibility, downtown and neighborhoods, neighborhood commercial nodes, pocket parks, urban design. And another uh, consultant to point out here is we also have a retail, a specialty retail consultant on the team, uh, Street Sense, who are looking at the retail environment downtown and what improvements could be made that might make um, owning a business, operating a business a little bit easier for folks, um, and just sort of looking at the overall retail environment um, from a physical sense as well as a market sense. Uh, and so that will be sort of wrapped into the Live WP chapter. Work WP, support a diverse economy, attract jobs, and strengthen the role of White Plains as a regional economic hub. And here you can see topics range from economic development, work from home, small business, major employers, workforce development. And I think in this chapter and throughout the plan, really, we do need to acknowledge, and I'm not going to lie, we haven't exactly figured this out, but we will need to acknowledge the pandemic, that we are in this sort of post pandemic phase, and what does that mean? There's a lot of things that are in flux right now in terms of work from home um, and what that might mean for you know, office space and downtowns and transportation and all these other things. And so we need to be, I think, very flexible over the next 18 months and kind of be following those trends and doing our, our best. And no one has a crystal ball, we can't predict, but we know that this was a major disruptor and business as usual is, is, is very likely changed forever um, and what that might look like we're not sure, but, but making sure we acknowledge that in the plan and where we can sort of plan for that uncertainty. Play WP, enhance the network of parks, support recreational cultural programming, and expand arts and entertainment options. Um, topics range here from active passive recreation, year-round activities, entertainment, etc. And then finally, strengthen WP. This is a really important chapter in the plan. Um, because it really sets up the operational functioning and, and, and the ability of the city to sort of implement and what's its operational capacity. Uh, allocate public resources to address the physical and social infrastructure needs of the community. It's also important to note that this chapter, Strengthen WP, is really where um, we will address social justice issues, and diversity and inclusion, um, you know, that that's really strengthening the White Plains community so that it really is about a one White Plains and really is a community for everyone. Uh, we'll be talking about city services, schools, public safety, that social justice piece, as I mentioned, social services and infrastructure. And then, this is probably hard to read, just as you know, uh, in your packet, you do have a much more detailed version of this, which is probably harder. <laughs> but as you can see, just in general, this is a complicated process. Uh, we've tried to make the schedule on the screen a little bit simpler. You can see that we've got we started this work in 2021, we're now midway through, almost midway through 2022, and we will go into 2023, um, a good portion of the year before we are, are finalized. So we're probably a, a third of the way through the process, um, a comprehensive planning process for those of you who've been through it before, is a time-consuming one, um, particularly in a community as diverse as White Plains, and really taking the time to make sure that we're hearing many voices and you know, really doing this correctly. Um, and then there's a whole public hearing process and approvals, and, I, and we'll talk about that in a moment. But you can see that we finished that plan phase. We're now into drafting the chapters, which is, I think we are sort of in here today. We are, we'll be drafting chapters over the summer and into the fall. And when we pick up with meetings again with this group in the fall, we will have draft materials to you, I'm assuming, by your September meeting, we'll have that introductory uh, the, the introductory chapter and the vision and goals chapter, and perhaps uh, we may have Green WP uh, for you as well. And so we will be starting to review materials and making sure we'll get them to you enough time. We'll get them to, uh, to you the day of the meeting, because that's not very useful. Um, and then once we've kind of gone through that process, you will ultimately have a draft plan before you 
um, that you will be responsible for having your own public hearing. And then once you've had them, that, once you've had that public hearing, you will be making any revisions that you all desire based on the comments that you've heard. And then that document ultimately goes to the city council for their own review and public hearing process. And so ultimately, at the end of the day, it's the city council that will adopt this document. It's really your responsibility to sort of shepherd this through the process. Um, so that's a perfect segue to your role uh, in this committee. I, I'm not sure, um, we may all be suffering a little bit of like, what have I gotten myself into? I'm not sure how correct you all were. Uh, but your main responsibility will be to participate in the CBC meetings. The next meeting, I believe, is scheduled not until September, I believe it's September 21st, um, with, the second, with the third meeting to follow in November 4th, 16th. Um, so for now, we're gonna, we're gonna kind of skip the summer, give us some time to actually start drafting, getting materials back to you for review, and then meet uh, every two months in the fall with, with the option perhaps later in the fall into the new year going monthly as we're really ramping up materials and getting a lot of feedback. Um, so the second task then is review and comment on draft plan and content, which is really the most critical role, um, but also representing the committee at public events and workshops, and then obviously hosting your own public process. It's no small feat when I'm getting through those tasks. Uh, so some upcoming public outreach uh, and your role in that. Um, June 15th, which is two weeks from yesterday, we are having our second public workshop that we have at the Jaguar Room in the Ninth the night building um, at seven, really seven to nine. This will be a interactive um, round table discussions. We will have round tables for, for each of the elements. Uh, people will sort of circulate through the room, have time at each table with a moderator from the professional staff the planning department. Um, there will be maps on the table. We'll really be talking about issues and opportunities, preliminary recommendations that the public may have around certain issues, and just really drawing things out and mapping and, and really get rolling up our sleeves and getting down to, to hard work. Uh, we will also be launching simultaneously an international uh, an interactive online mapping tool, we'll talk about white plains, not international, um, which will be similar in a way to the companion piece that happened in the first workshop online. This will be a map-based, um, an interactive mapping tool organized around the elements where the public can come and drop a pin and say, you know, I have an issue with this intersection, or I'd like to see a park at this location, or uh, you know, they can make general comments as well, but it's a way to sort of really visualize what some of the issues are, what are the opportunities, and what are some, some preliminary solutions. Uh, and we'll probably leave that up, I imagine, for about six months as we're just moving through this process, which I'm hard to do with that. Uh, and so again, if someone can't make the workshop, the presentation would be recorded, they can watch that online and then do a companion exercise um, online. Or if somebody was at the workshop, had additional thoughts on it, they can go and in their own time participate. Oh, I got ahead of myself here. Um, you, will, you will notice in your um, folder you each have 10 flyers. Your homework for the night is to go out, hang these in your place of employment, your business, give them to your neighbors, your family, your <laughs> anyone you know. You've got 10 of them. You, I know you all know these 10 people. so. Um, you know, uh, feel free to, to, to post these liberally. There's also a stack of Spanish version flyers um, that we would encourage you to take as well. Um, and just on a note on, on um, uh, translation services at the first workshop, we do, uh, and at the second one as well, we will have Spanish uh, translation services available. Uh, there was a card at the sign-in desk for anyone who needs that. We have the, the PowerPoint will be available in Spanish, and during the presentation, we can have our translators sit with the Spanish-speaking uh, folks to help them translate, and then walk, you know, sort of shadow them through the event and, and simultaneously translate. Um, and we will be producing all of the materials um, in English and in Spanish as well. Um, so following this, at the meeting, the short presentation, the facilitated roundtable discussions will then do a report back 
so everybody can hear sort of what, what, what we said in the room. Um, we want to keep it brief. The commissioner actually had a great idea on the report back. Instead of having the facilitator of each table report back, sort of have the cohort that went through all six stations together report back on a designated report, you know, uh, model and speaker, and sort of give an overview of their experience with moving through the room together, which is kind of a nice way of, of you know, feeling like you're in this together as a, as a community. And with that, I'm going to turn it back to Katie to demo, to demo the uh, website. Thank you, Sarah. All right. Um, so I know we've mentioned the website a lot, so I think it's time to check it out. Okay, so this is oneyplanes.com. Um, this is the landing page, which kind of gives an overview of the process. Like I said, there's the imagine phase, there's plan, which we're currently in now, and then we will move to implement. Um, if you click learn more under any of these buttons, it will take you to learn more about any, each of those phases. Um, we just have a little primer of what a comprehensive plan is, um, as well as um, advertising our, public, our upcoming public workshop. Um, so that's sort of just the landing page, um, and our contact information is there at the bottom. Um, if you go to Imagine, it sort of gives you a full summary of everything that I went through with you guys earlier. Um, there's a lot of videos, pictures, presentations, all kinds of good stuff in there. Um, so a lot of that's what I covered, but I do want to point that out to you. And then the next section is plan, which we're in now. Um, so we have each of the elements, um, like Sarah presented, um, they are all going to have individual pages. Um, so this information is similar to the information that you already have, um, but just getting familiar with the website I think is really important. Um, we also have a map gallery with a lot of our base maps there, um, as well as documents with all of the plans that Eileen had mentioned. Um, and then finally, I will take you to our participate tab. Um, so this is where we're going to be, this is where we currently have participation opportunities and where we'll be putting um, the interactive mapping tool in the future. Um, so if you go on here now, you can still provide comments on the vision statement and the elements um, that we presented. And you also have the opportunity to read what other people have commented. And you can even add like, a little like or dislike to comments that you've seen. Um, so that is just a little rundown of the website, and then lastly, I think we turn it back to you guys, right? So I want to thank all of the uh, presenters that presented this evening. Um, it's really um, a remarkable team that we have working on this, and it's wonderful to welcome you all this evening to be part of that team, which leads us to the question um, about what are you all, as we move through all the material, and I know it was a lot, so as you're processing all that material and you're thinking about your role on this CPC, the Comprehensive Plan Committee, what, what, do, you, what do you think you need to keep in mind to help make this process successful? And I'll just throw that question out there. I might ask Michael. Michael, you, can you still hear us? Yeah. What do you think, Michael? I'm going to put you on the spot. Um, what do you think? What's one thing that you're thinking about that you need to keep in mind to make the process successful? Well, I, I'm very impressed with the language and the uh, embracing uh, the strengths and diversity that have been presented thus far. Um, White Plains is, as everyone has said, is just a wonderful place to live. And it is built on diversity, and it is built on fairness and equity. Uh, it, it, in many ways, a terrific example uh, for you know, how a community can uh, move forward and be successful. And I, I think a lot of those values need to, need to be uh, applied in our work. You know, uh, it's a diverse group of people with many different perspectives. Uh, be respectful of those, pull together, 
know, we're all pulling in the rowboat together. There's not going to be much use of being adversarial or, or uh, as the mayor said, just difficult to kind of address this. The thing to do is work together and recognize our strength is in that diversity. So I think a lot of that groundwork has been laid in what I've seen in this presentation, and I think that it would be great for us to keep uh, those values uh, top of mind as we go forward. Thank you so much. Other thoughts about things to keep in mind as we move through the process to make it successful? I think kind of along the lines of what Michael was saying, uh, the mayor also said it too. Everybody can't be here or be part of it. So we need to keep that in mind. And we need to be able to try and get as much input and feedback from those who can't be here as part of this process. Excellent, excellent point. And um, I know Sarah made this point as well, and, and you're right, Ken, we can't, we can't have everything, we can't get all the way. There's 15, what is it, 59,589, something like that. Um, uh, but you've all got 10 flyers tonight, and if you each invited 10 people, we would exceed the capacity that we have at the Jaguar room. So uh, we want to make sure that, um, that we invite people whose voices Maybe they've never showed up at a meeting before. Maybe they've never participated in something like this, and they can come to a meeting or they can interact online. So thank you for that. Other thoughts? Things to keep in mind to make things successful? No. Uh, one notice is that while the outline that we have here is a draft, the objective is set. So keeping in mind that we are working towards this one white line, but still being flexible as we gather this feedback and continuing to improve, because I think even Chris last conversation and how Sarah you put it today as well that change is inevitable and I guess of that too. So being open to that change and being open to receiving feedback and constantly updating as we progress uh, through, along this plan is important I believe. I love that and um, when we were putting this together and we looked at the when we were running through it uh, as a team of the office we put up the vision statement and we sort of made the joke like how many hours of our time went into drafting that vision statement? Because, as you said, the vision is really, and that's why we spend so much time on the listening tour and the vision aspect, because what we have to do now is um, operationalize that. And what we have to do is test all everything that we come up with against, does that get us to that vision? So I think you're absolutely right. The goal is set, but the rest, the, the rest of the work is up to you guys. Other thoughts about things to keep in mind to make the process successful? I'm leading. Yeah, these flyers, a lot of people don't have the time or the ability to go to the meetings or, or the interest, frankly, but you can start <laughs> conversations with people. And as representatives, you can come and present their views. And, you know, speaking Excellent. to someone at the softball game, at church, or whatever, and you can you have an opportunity to represent their views at these meetings. Yeah, that's an excellent point. Other thoughts? John. Uh, we have to at least recognize uh, we're going through an extraordinary period of growth uh, and the development of the city has been uh, actually unthinkable in, in comparison to where we were a few years ago. When I came to White Plains in 1981, the majority of the, of the development was condominium in nature. Uh, so. They were developing the city for home ownership. Uh, that pendulum has swung. Uh, almost everything that's being built here now are rental apartments. So I think that le that lends itself to a some level of transience, as opposed to somebody that comes and buys a home and puts down roots here, as opposed to somebody who will do a two-year rental and you know onto the next town or job description. Uh, bringing that with the traffic that it brings to bear, I think that's one thing that we're gonna to have to be pretty definite about, or the city's not gonna be fun to live in if we can't get around other than, other than in the walking downtown. Thank you, excellent point. Um, other, other thoughts? Right. It occurs to me that we're trying to prepare for the future 
that to some extent is unknown. And how do we have a plan that is adaptable to changes when they come and that can take that feedback 5, 10, 15 years from now? So it's sort of some getting the input from the community is one thing. And that's important because my experience, a lot of smart people in my clients who are thinking out of the box. So how do we assure that we haven't missed something? We're taking on a post-pandemic, complicated world, trying to find out, to pick up on John's point, how do we assure the quality of life that we've all enjoyed will be here 5, 10, 15, 20 years from now? And as a subset of that, sort of from a personal point of view, the economic opportunities that White Plains provided me and my family were, I think, accidental for me. And how do we assure that those same opportunities for upward mobility, I don't mean disparage to others, but having a chance to advance our families, their quality of life, and their futures. We have a big responsibility to try and overcome so many challenges that everybody faces these days. And land planning is part of it. But I think listening to what the preamble was, that this is a different kind of plan. Plans years ago were we're going to put the offices here, we're going to put the residential there, the roads are going to go this way and that way. Who really plan the life of the people that are coming? And in some cases, it's our children and our grandchildren and those that we don't know are coming. And I've just been reflecting on it, and it's awesome. I'm not sure there's clarity for us to build on. In the sort of old days, which is my world, we knew what the, the options were. We had more clarity. And I don't think it's there. So we have an interesting opportunity and responsibility to find those tidbits of genius in the list and the comments from the public. And somehow, how do we listen to them? Not just in our own, but as you're all talking, I'm thinking, I'd love to have coffee with some of you guys. <laughs> Come in here once a month. I mean, that's not, I know John, I know Eileen, I know Bonnie, and I, I don't know everyone else, but I'd like to. Uh, that's the only way, and I'm, I'm a professional planner by background and an engineer, and I only survive with brainstorm. And that happens best around the table when I don't have to prepare my notes and be professional. But I've been around long enough that I'm not embarrassed if I say something wrong. But how do we get to know each other and build on our experiences? Because only I know John and Bonnie, that's it. And I see a world of experience here that we all represent people that haven't had the voice or the opportunity. We have an obligation to be their futurist physician, if you will, to diagnose what it is that will make their life a good life 10, 15 years from now. And if we don't, my grandchildren are never going to forgive me. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Mike. Other thoughts? Yeah, about that? Making the process successful as we move through it? Any questions about anything that's been presented this evening or the process or how things are going to work moving forward? Are we allowed to meet with each other? <laughs> yes. Yes. You are not subject to the open meeting law, so yes. Is there a folks on the phone? The question was, are, are you guys allowed to meet outside of these meetings? And the answer is yes. You're not subject to the open meetings law, so you are welcome to go have coffee, tea. The follow-up question was, is there a contact list? Yes. Yes, there is a contact list. And um, probably what we'll do is just send an email around and ask if anybody objects to having their contact information on the contact list. And if we hear none, we will we'll send it out to everybody. That would be great. Um, I have a question if it's OK. If, of course it's OK, Mike. Uh, this came up in a CNA meeting, which is the Council of Neighborhoods, a lot of neighbors get together with the president and we discuss matters, uh, share information and whatnot. A, a member brought up a terrific point 
question. And, you know, the mechanism for it, I don't see it built into this plan. Frankly, I never see it built into almost anyone's plan. And that's really kind of the post-mortem. It's the autopsy. We're, we've been living under a plan that was initially, I guess, put together in the late 90s and then updated in 2006 or 8. And the, that plan uh, is what we're sort of, I guess, you know, in, we're, we're sort of living through the product of it, the result of that plan. It set the goals, the priorities, around the city, and so forth. That plan has a lot of elements. What worked? What did we actually close on? What didn't work? What never happened? And, you know, that's something that tells us a little bit about, you know, what, um, it kind of informs, I'm not saying that your job is to go back and audit that plan, but, you know, part of, part of this kind of process, you know, it, it, there's a Q&A, but it, there's a quality assurance process, right? And the quality assurance says, are we actually producing the results that we said were in our plan? Or is the plan just a great document that we kind of like, uh, it's a wish list and kind of is not real in the sense that anyone's really implementing it for real, if you know what I mean. So how do we kind of do the QA? How do we have the quality assurance? How do we know that the plan is actually working after publication as it's being implemented? Not in year one, in year three or four, and that was supposed to an earlier question about, you know, the plan needs to have flexibility to be able to adapt because we don't know really what's going to happen four or five years from now. But, but I thought that that person from my CNA meeting said, you know, that was about, I was on the last committee, or I don't know what role that, that person was in, but said, you know, I asked for open space. There has been anything done on open space. Now, I don't know what, what she's saying is true, but she's pointing out a, a, an issue, and that issue is the plan will have a lot of positive things. And the question is, how do we audit that those positive things get hit on? That's a great question, and I'm going to actually ask Eileen McLean to start answering that. Uh, so our consultants were kind enough to uh, deconstruct the previous comprehensive plan and identify every strategy uh, listed in that comprehensive plan. And I had the pleasure of going through each of them and identifying whether we had achieved that goal or whether it was no longer a priority or whether it's still a priority and something that we to work on. So that was that was one part of that. The other thing is we kind of have a report card process where the uh, planning board went through um, a similar exercise a number of years ago where we reviewed what has been done and, and what how how are we doing with achieving those goals. Um, after the comprehensive plan is adopted, we kind of pow out in the planning department and go over uh, low-hanging fruit and then more complex issues. Um, so there are provisions, or historically have been provisions for, for doing exactly what you're asking for. Um, and it seems that with the process to date, we are catching up on that and uh, it is a part of our review for this comprehensive plan as well. And one thing I would add to that, Sorry, one thing I would add to that. Oh. Wait, my, Katie, Katie's going to add something to what I need to say. Hang on one second. Go ahead, Katie. Go ahead. So, one thing I would add to that is actually what I find to be the most important part of the planning process, which is the evaluation of the recommendations that have been put in place. Um, and that's really going to come into play in the implement phase of the plan. And one of the reasons why we chose to put it online is to kind of, instead of having to go through and comb through the text and actually find what those implementation measures might be, they're going to be more accessible for people. They're going to be, um, you know, just, I mean, more accessible, definitely graphic, and we can actually report, like, status updates in that uh, manner as well. Right, we're, we're hoping that there can be a tracking mechanism for, for what's you know, in process, what's underway, perhaps a timeline for, for some of the longer term um, recommendations. So it's really a twofold piece. The very first task that, that we were tasked with on the 
plan and consultant was to really do that inventory piece and pull that together to give to the city so that they could provide us. We want to start from where we are today, not where the plans, you know, was back in 2006. We need to know what's been done, what hasn't been done, and sort of where we are. And that's really our starting point. Uh, I don't want to speak for the city, but it should be possible that later in the summer to share that document. Right? There's a reason we couldn't share that right. for the members on the on the board or the, the planning committee to see what was in that plan and sort of the status of all of those things, so that you have that same same starting point that we all have. Actually, just thinking out loud, how about you include, uh, like you said, metrics or success metrics or how are we this plan is going to be rolled out as part of the plan, like an appendix towards the very end. In five years, this is what the city. Yes, yeah, well, that's exactly what that last yeah. implementation chapter is. Okay. It will have. I mean, it may have some text. It may have maps that, that specify certain future land uses, zoning recommendations. But it will also have a matrix that will have what the. Uh, it'll be a matrix of all of the recommendations, and then who's responsible for implementing the time frame for implementation, and then sort of a, a box where you can even check whether it's been done. And so, Michael, can you hear that? What Sarah was just saying about the matrix? Yep. yep. Okay. So, yep. And, and we basically, you know, I think it's terrific uh, that uh, you know the, the, the quality assurance kind of measures kind of uh, as we roll this thing out are there. You thought about that. I mean, I'm absolutely uh, delighted to hear that uh, the planning department has uh, audited a lot of the processes and suggestions and thoughts of uh, the earlier plan. I think it would be, and I know that this is the first this is, I think it would be great if we actually knew what the score was. <laughs> I, don't I, I don't mean that to be snarky. I really think that there's going to be learning and saying, you know, heck, we thought this was going to be a very important part of the process or our plan. It just never coalesced or it didn't happen or we couldn't implement. There's probably things that there's learning in those failures that we should try to apply as we try to do another one of these. And, um, you know, uh, that's, the, that's one of our greatest features is when we stumble, right? And I'm sure, you know, there's a lot of successes that were achieved under the old plan, but I'm sure that there were some areas where we could have done better. And uh, I'm kind of curious as to what those, what were, what were those areas and how can we do a better job in, in working on this next one? Michael, what I found was um, that uh, some of those things that we didn't achieve, I thought, oh, thank goodness, we didn't do that. <laughs> <laughs> or, um, and we're going through just like, you know, we are saying, well, we didn't see that coming. You know, when we did the update in 2005 and 6, we had no idea, we had to update because we didn't ever anticipate that the downtown would become a residential hotbed. And so we had to update our comprehensive plan for that to accommodate for that. So that was something that we really didn't see coming. We had planned previously for it to be a concentration of office. So surprise, we've got a lot of residential interest. Or uh, we didn't see COVID coming. We, we didn't see 9-11 coming. All these things are, are big influencers. And um, you know the, the priorities of the community shift as well over such a great length of time. So uh, the report card, Going through it, it's, it's very nice that it's in a spreadsheet and there are comments on each thing, um, but uh, as I said, some of those things are no longer priorities and, uh, and other things, thank goodness we didn't do it. But it's well, an interesting... I've known, it, it, I, I've known that... Go ahead, let's work. No, I mean, it's an interesting question about how best to, sh to share that, and so we will definitely do some thinking about that. And, and as, the, as we've been talking about now, building that right in to this new plan so that in 10 years there's not a question about it. It's right up there you know, on the, on the plan website. So that's really good. Yeah, we can update the website and say, check, we did Right, that. exactly. So uh, John has a question or comment. Yeah, it's more of a comment than anything else. Once completed and being put into practice, I know we deal with this at the planning board all the time. Whatever projects that we're looking at have to be consistent with the comprehensive plan. Exactly. And I tend to look at the plan as a shield, and people that disagree with projects tend to use it as a sword. 
uh, and it, it get, gets used to further uh, elaborate not my backyard agendas. Uh, the less ambiguity, the better, and Eileen or Katie could weigh in on this because this comes up all the time and they wind up doing the research to see if indeed there are any areas where it's not consistent or it is consistent. I'm sure zoning goes through the same, the same issues. Yeah. Right. That's what, one of the reasons why this is so, it's such an important document. It's an interesting because what Eileen just said is that we had a comprehensive plan that did envision more office space downtown, and yet there is tons of residential. So what happened? Why do we have a comprehensive plan if we let different development occur? So is all this exercise for nothing? Well, no. Most of what you look at, you've got to remember zoning and property plans are supposed to be flexible. They're supposed to move, ebb and flow with the city. And that's where we get into a lot of problems. Everybody thinks that zoning should be hard fast. Comprehensive plan should be hard fast. And this is what a zoning should be. But if you really truly want to design a city for grandkids, is what I always say, it's got to be as flexible because there may be new technology that comes out. There may be, you know, who would have thought of all of the electric scooters or the bikes or ride who would have thought that? Cars. Right? That's, that was the biggest thing that I was an example was just the driverless cars that is coming. People don't even realize that it's coming and how far along it is. It's just, it's a matter of within the next decade it will happen. But if you haven't planned for it, you get left behind on a lot of stuff. If you at least have mentioned it, put a little something in there, you can at least grab onto that nugget and as you start to have that development come in, you can say, well, we didn't mention it in the conference plan, okay, you can start to refine it and and I think, I think the other thing is that the market can be very hard to predict. And so if White Plains had historically been a, a, you know, a, a concentration of office uses in the downtown, the plan was anticipating that those trends would continue. And if you didn't have the planners and the, the committee and the public didn't have a crystal ball at that time to see that there were major disruptions happening in retail, or, sorry, residential in downtowns and this sort of move to, to people moving back to downtowns and wanting walkability and all the things that go with living in a city. And so there's sort of, there can be that, that disconnect that you either plan for what you know or you, you, you plan for what you want and what you want may not be the reality. I mean, we can all say, you know, we would love, I don't know, a, an aquarium or a, a, a Smithsonian Museum in, in, in downtown. You know, I'm sure everyone would love that, but the reality is that those things don't just happen on their own. And so the recommendations and the initiatives really need to be based on trends, on sort of best estimates of future trends. That's why we have retail consultants specifically looking at that issue. But also on reality. They have to be based in reality and things that are achievable and attainable. And yet we want to have vision and we want to have foresight, but we can't. You know, we're not going to plan for sort of the ridiculous in a way, you know, just because we want it or someone in the community wants it doesn't mean that it's achievable or realistic. And so that's where you have professional staff that are sort of providing that balance, that checks and balance of, of what's achievable. And also that we're not repeating mistakes of the past where there's been plenty of planning that was discriminatory, exclusionary, and all of these things that everyone thought, or maybe they didn't, but many people would say they thought they were doing the right thing or what was best because that's what people wanted. And so there may be very hard conversations along the way where we have to say, you know what, there are unintended consequences to that recommendation and we need to think about it. And is everyone comfortable making that decision? Um, and we might still say, you know what, we wouldn't recommend that because it could have these unintended consequences. Um, and sometimes people, as you all know, you deal with the public as well, may recommend things that are just very self-interested, have you know, maybe coded, in a way, and so just being very open about that and keeping ourselves honest and accountable, I think, is really important in this process. But I, I was wondering, what has been happening to White Plains in the, 90, the 80s when I moved to Westchester? There were great stores on the Merrick Avenue, then we opened the Galleria, which is started Merrick. And now, thanks to COVID and thanks to online shopping, the Galleria is being destroyed. So, what's next? Are we just going to have a city of apartments? Because offices are not going to be around because people are working from home. 
uh, stores are not going to be around because we're shopping online. So are we going towards just a residential city? I think, we, I, I think we need a, a healthy downtown to have a balance of uses. Uh, and the more residents you have, the more shoppers you have, the more, I mean, restaurants, coffee shops, things go along with that. And, and I think most, of, many of you know that retail, it, the nature of retail has changed completely. That's why we specifically brought our retail consultant onto the team, because it is such a huge issue when you have a lot of retail space. Uh, you know, Westchester Mall, White Plains Mall, sorry, you know, we need that, that's a big piece of this, and figuring out what makes sense there, and how, how or whatever goes there sort of fits with uh, the vision for the city and, and the downtown. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think really looking at, at what's sustainable, what's, what, what makes it a desirable place to live and not losing, transitioning completely from one thing, an office city, to an all residential city. I mean, you have some of your, your neighboring cities have that very issue where it's really a residential bedroom community and there's nothing nothing to do with downtown. So my, my hope, and maybe, you know, if there is a benefit of COVID, it may be that there are more daytime residents here that go out for a walk and, you know, run some errands and, and that may contribute to a little bit more vibrant uh, shopping environment. And, and I do think, too, you know, when, when they did the plan in, in the 90s and then in 2006, nobody really understood at that time that the shopping mall was going to go away forever. I mean, that's not a, a trend specific to White Plains. That was a mistake made everywhere. Um, but luckily, your mall is right near downtown. Huh? And so there's a lot of opportunity there. I just put the uh, vision statement back up because I think really we just want to keep driving our thoughts back to that vision, um, which is, which is, so you could have a, so we have a focus to keep looking at, I guess is, is the best way to put that. Just my train of thought. Vanilla, I have a question for you guys actually. So your white weights were especially mm -hmm. you really, you all agree on that, right? Sure. But um, there's always uh, reference you're always in competition with somebody trying to beat those guys up or trying to make somebody look like us. Right? Do you have any references of cities similar to this and what's happening there? You're drawing, I mean, not just less than but good values or any ideas of recognition they have? Absolutely. Um, Thomas has just joined our firm, um, was the Commissioner of Economic Development for the city of Stanford. Uh, so he has a lot of experience he's bringing to bear. Prior to that, he was the county director for the town of Greenberg. Uh, BFJ as a firm has done, I don't know, dozens upon dozens of comprehensive plans in Westchester County and throughout the state, uh, in Connecticut, New Jersey as well. And so we do have a lot of experience in that. And every community is unique, and White Plains is special. <laughs> and the one thing I can say um, that truly makes, in my opinion, White Plains special is that almost every person we have met says how special it is and doesn't complain. I mean, people complain, I'm not going to say people don't complain, I've been to planning board meetings, people complain. But in general, you know, we met with business owners, we've met with various stakeholders, we've met with city staff. Everyone loves it here. And that is something to be so proud of. And, you know, I think starting there and then really using some of the lessons that we've learned in other communities about recommendations that have worked, recommendations that haven't worked trends, you know, plans that we started two years ago or five years ago, kind of seeing where things have gone, um, you know, updates in technology, you know, modern, you know, different trends and techniques and zoning, that, you know, there's a lot of experience that we bring um, to the table, and I think that's why the city brought us on, and hopefully that, that really can be what we, we bring to the table in this process. See, I'm excited just to be part of this because I am a former resident of White Plains. I live in my place to live here. And of course, you know, when we go by house, we can report it. And so I'm one of those cases where you lost me, where I would have loved to have seen people down the roots here, and probably was partisan in the white line, was to move away from more plans than we love to hear. So, you know, okay. how, how do you plan for people like me in the future? Right. And our children, I know a lot of my neighbors and my son, they can't afford to live in. So, is there a way that we can plan for that? Try. That's what we're working on. <laughs> I wish I had the apartment when I was here. Yeah, yeah, the apartment's cool. just a variety of, and that, that is the Go Under Live 
IWP is to provide a variety of housing options for all, for all ages, all demographics, and all various levels of need. Um, it's not, obviously, we all know that it's not an easy thing to achieve, but, you know, we, we do have strategies and approaches and techniques that we can bring to bear and, and then see what happens. Um, obviously, the disconnect, I think, a little bit is that so much of many of the implementation pieces is, is dependent in a way on the private market. You can't always predict what that market will do. Um, but you have been incredibly successful at uh, attracting private investment. So, you know, there is, I think there is a lot of potential. I have one other question. One of the things that I keep you, I see, I have heard in the past four years that I've looked at white lines. Uh, they used to be a Walmart, but I guess I actually have an overlap when I moved here that was just putting me out here. But uh, quite a few people told me that having Walmart here used to attract people from neighboring towns to come here because it's a very large store. Same goes for the Westchester Mall. I actually have friends that live in Queens and Bronx that say that, oh, I drive down to White Plains with my family for grocery shopping. Like, what? Why would you come here for? But it's kind of like a little more peaceful, I guess, to come here than go to the store that they have there. And which of the six elements that we consider here in our outline will include White Plains being attractive to neighboring towns and cities? So that is really embedded in all of the elements, that, the, that residents and visitors and workers all sort of take equal footing because they all use the city in a way. And so each element will address those various groups and stakeholders. Um, you know, obviously workers and job opportunities, those things will be covered more heavily in the work WP, and visitors may be covered a little bit more in retail, the retail section, and uh, play WP and looking at the entertainment options. But a big part of that plan, of the plan, is looking at you know, potential recommendations and strategies for attracting visitors to spend money here. I mean, that's a big piece of it. And, right, and connect to WP. And connect so to WP, right, how people get out here. It's, it's, so it's, 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 I think that's really important because, of, you know, we had a table at the farmer's market a couple of weeks ago and we were, we had the flyers for the public workshop and people would say, well, I don't live here, so I shouldn't come to this public workshop. I said, but you, but you work here, you shop here, like we, and maybe one day you would live here. Like maybe if we had a housing option that was attractive to you, you would move here. So we'd love to hear from that, from from all people that are using White Plains at all. We talked about that a lot. So we definitely want to. I, I have a question, Judy and Sarah. Yes, sir. Um, Judy, you have a question. All of the six components of the chapters, if you will, of the planning. One of the things that I don't really see, and, and you know, I'm not saying it should be the dominant thing, but all of this is related to money. Our city runs on money, revenue, taxes, schools. All of those things that are in those chapters all depend on revenue and expenses. And what I think would be good from my perspective is to see the impact of each of those on, you know, the city's finances. How, how, how you know, to make all of the ends meet, there are probably certain, let's call them chapters, which have more of a role in making ends meet than others, right? So, uh, you know, can't have certain things if you can't have the revenue to support those things. So money is an underlying uh, scaffolding or structure to all of it, but it isn't really been said yet in everything I've heard. Yes, you're 100% correct on that comment, and that really gets addressed in two ways in the process. One is in the implementation chapter, there is an acknowledgement of the cost of certain projects or services, depending on what the proposals are. There could be even a preliminary cost estimate if it was appropriate for a certain infrastructure improvement or some other uh, identifiable uh, capital improvement. Um, but there's also a section there that may, you know, could identify potential funding opportunities, grant programs, state funding, um, 
and an acknowledgement of tax revenues from additional retail or residential development. But the other piece is that there is an environmental review process that follows the, uh, you know, we'll probably start that about two thirds of the way through the process that will have, will need to have, depending on the recommendations, we don't know what they are yet, but if there's proposals for, an, you know, additional res, uh, zoning density that could result in new residents, there would need to be an analysis of what the impacts of potential population from those recommendations. So a look at you know, the capacity of the schools, tax implications, um, you know, other costs of municipal services. So that really gets addressed uh, through the environmental review process. I think the other thing to keep in mind is that <clears throat> a comprehensive plan is a recommendation document. At the end of this process, when the comprehensive plan gets adopted, nothing actually gets constructed. <laughs> so, you know, it's not really until you get to the implementation piece and, and zoning amendments are not, just to be clear at the outset, that this process is not anticipating that zoning text amendments would result at the end of this. There will most likely, I think we can say, be recommendations for zoning amendments that are addressed in the plan. There may be outlined um, some specifics, but as part of the environmental review, we're not proposing uh, to undertake an analysis of major zoning changes. There will be a process that follows the comprehensive plan of updating the zoning code in some fashion, I, I, I would imagine. I don't know that yet. We haven't gotten anywhere near that level of detail, but typically that's the process. You finish the plan, you then, once that's adopted, one of the first implementation tools is really updating the zoning code. But again, there's a cost associated with that, and the city would need to plan for that either in their budget, find grant funding, et cetera, and so that may take a little bit of time to follow. Um, and then typically, you have a more significant environmental review once you know what the, the specifics of the zone are. But the environmental review for the comprehensive plan needs to anticipate all of that, but it is done at a more generic um, analysis level. Well, can I, uh, just in a very simplistic way, this is a very, I don't want to very deep, it's very complicated. Speak up, Mike. Uh, for instance, in a very simple way of looking at this, for me, so, you know, the school system, is a huge uh, uh, draw, or could be a drag, depending on the quality of the school system, attracting people who want to live in your city, right? So, uh, but the school system, uh, to implement things, the school system to be successful, may exceed the resources of the community, right? So, this is one of those things where I say, oh, I'm looking at the uh, you know, I'm, I'm a, uh, a guy who's a, a, a lead architect, a leader of environmental design, stuff like that. I've taken courses and gotten that sort of designation, that's my name. But, you know, green, uh, the green WP portion of this, right? Well, it has a revenue impact. It's not just an implementation and a vision and a thing. It has a revenue impact. Think, think some of these elements will cost money, some of these elements will save money for the city. And what I'm getting at is, this chapter, Green Elf with WP, I think, it, I, I think of it as kind of as a lever in the overall budget of making the city work. This has positives and negatives. How is that, how are the economic uh, components of a chapter and its implications for how it may affect the finances, is, is that going to be part of your analysis and your recommendation? Is there a, is there an economic analysis of each of these chapters and what they contribute or what their costs will be so that we say, gee, we want to have the city to be a pedestrian-free, wonderful place to walk around, but yeah, um, the fact is the city is very, currently still very car-centric. And if everyone is going to rent one of these apartments, one of these new buildings downtown is going to bring a car. And, you know, so what is, you know, if, there's costs involved in all of these things. And I'm just trying to say, is there a finance layer that sits on top of and is part of the analysis of each chapter so that as we're working through this, we kind of go, yeah, this particular thing would be great, but it, 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 it has a huge financial cost and you know, something over here is can have a real benefit for us, but you know, uh, we have to invest in. Understanding that, that all of these things have 
financial components to this is what I'm getting at. And, and when I look at the chapters as they presented right now, the cost part of it is not really at least apparent in, 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 in the plot, right? So that, that each one of these things does have a cost component that needs to Mike. be more true. Mike, I think we I, I think we understood the question. So hold on a second. Do we have a response? Sarah's going to respond. Yeah. So typically, in a comprehensive planning process, we don't provide that detailed fiscal analysis on each impact because these documents are citywide. They're aspirational, and it's not like it's a comp a master plan for a smaller downtown area where you actually know what all the improvements are. Many of the, the recommendations and the initiatives will be studies of, of more detail. For instance, you know, if there was a desire to change the traffic pattern in downtown, this plan wouldn't provide the analysis that would support that change. It would recommend that that be studied. Um, obviously, if there are major you know, financial implications of a recommendation or an initiative, we would want to look at that. But again, these are aspirational documents um, that are over 10 to 15 years, and so anticipating how much development, where it may go, how many trees you may need, or whatever the costs are is just impossible at this scale. I mean, we're talking about a city the size of White Plains, and there may be recommendations for increasing the tree canopy. How do you put a cost to that? Um, and there's also, we do identify funding streams, but funding streams change in the next 10 years. You know, there's a lot more federal money right now post-pandemic because of the pandemic to fund infrastructure, and we couldn't have anticipated that. And so we don't want to limit ourselves in the recommendations because we don't have the money right now, uh, because you may be able to get it in the future. And so... So what I heard you say is the plan is aspirational, and so the, and then the... The implementation is really where the fiscal aspect gets played into. Um, Mike, I'm going to move. Uh, Mike Dalton, I'm going to move on to Mike Dibney. Yeah, thank you for thank you for answering. Of course. In reflecting on the challenge we face and thinking about the questions and some of the questions you raised before and old history, White Plains has always been adapted. White Plains has always adapted to the situation at the moment. And why is that? White Plains has a, if you will, an infrastructure. There's a public realm in White Plains. The streets, the sidewalks, the parks. That public realm has adapted from the day Nestle decided to move their headquarters to White Plains 40 years ago, when B. Altman's moved their department store to White Plains X number of years ago. White Plains had the, the infrastructure to adapt to that corporate office market because they wanted more taxes. They had the opportunity to adapt to the growing retail market. At one point, we had more shop, more downtown department stores than all but two cities in the whole country. And now, it turns out, people want this kind of a community. All the reasons that we should figure out, by the way, footnote, we should find out why everybody loves it so much. We need you to tell us, why are we so in love with this city? But we had a public realm infrastructure that has adapted to trend after trend after trend. And we had wise leadership all during that time. And I would say non-political leadership. They loved White Plains. They had run for a different party from now and then. But they weren't, they're not political. So how do we imagine or prepare for that next evolution? And how do we enhance the public realm? Chris Gomez and your department have already started out with bicycle ways by Martine Avenue. That's just a drop in the water. From my point of view as a resident and observer, our one weakness is we're not as beautiful as we could be. The White Plains Beautification Foundation, on its own, has probably done as much to make this city an attractive place to walk, to drive, and to have this sense of calm. So, and I've been reflecting since I got the call that you're going to be doing something, and now I'm finding out what it is. And I'm focusing on the public realm, because the public realm has always 
than our stadium. Everybody can walk on the sidewalks. Now, some of our sidewalks are not that great. And if there is an inequity, it is traffic in places that is concentrated. I'm trying to solve the problem. But traffic is close to where many people live. We ought to figure out how to make all the public realms beautiful, safe, environmentally sound, pollution free, and a source of calm and growth and well being. Well, I think that is is the perfect way to wrap up this meeting. So Mike, thank you so much. I appreciate that. <laughs> that's, that's our rally that's our rallying call. I really appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so you all should have a sense now of um, the work that lays before us. I want to thank you again for your uh, willingness to participate on this committee and uh, look forward to, um, to our next steps, which is our June 15th public workshop. And um, we will, I'm sorry, Sarah is. I forgot one, one very important thing about the June 15th workshop, and that is your role in it. Um, we would encourage all of you to attend to maybe pick a table or end the topic that you are interested in and sort of buddy up with one of the moderators. You don't have to really do anything more than that than represent this committee at that meeting, but I think it would be a helpful way to have you here as people come through the room and what those conversations are. Um, your names will be on, on a slide in the presentation. We'll probably ask you to stand and, and identify yourselves, and really you are an ambassador uh, between the city and the public in this process. And so we ask that you attend if you are able and participate as much as you feel comfortable with. So thank you all. So we hope to see you on the 15th. I know some people already have told me that they can't make it, and we certainly understand that. And we are looking forward to planning for one-way planes. <laughs> <laughs>